Yeah, let's start with this new administration of Putin in which he put an economist as the head of the Ministry of Defense. And when you look at these changes, we know that Shoigu was promoted to a higher position. And But when it comes to this strategy of putting a, an economist as the head of the Ministry of Defense, in your opinion, what's in the mind of Putin? Well, it's, it's the fact that uh, the, the defense spending uh, in Russia uh, has exceeded 6% which is a rather large number. And um, there is some optimization to be done. Uh, that optimization uh, is best done by an experienced economist who has specific experience with integrating military and civilian industrial projects with quite a bit of success. So he is basically uh, very, um, uh, very, capable of doing that exact job. And that that's why he was chosen. Uh, as far as Shoigu, yes, it's a promotion. And uh, uh, I think given Shoigu's experience as a, as the Minister of Defense in, in really changing the image of the Russian military for the better and changing the welfare and, and the provisioning of the, of the troops for the better, uh, he can uh, he can best uh, be employed in in other capacities now. We the reaction coming from the West was so interesting. There is an article in New York Times. It says Putin's new war weapon: an economist managing the military. How did you find the reaction coming from the West to these new changes? Uh, pretty much nonsensical. Uh, there's there's nothing strange uh, about. Uh, excuse me, one second. Uh, there is nothing at all strange with having a civilian uh, as the sec uh, as the minister of defense. Uh, that is uh, fairly typical. Um, that has been the pattern during the Soviet times, and and it is now. Uh, you know that Shoigu was not really a military man. He worked for a very long time as head of the emergency service. Um, which is a uniformed service, but it's not part of the military. So um, basically this is uh, uh, replacing one civilian with another. It's just that one of those civilians was in uniform prior to becoming the, the Minister of Defense, while this particular uh, Minister of Defense will continue in civilian clothing throughout. Um, it doesn't really make any difference um, it, the, the Minister of Defense is someone who oversees the entire operation of, of, the, uh, of the military and the industry that, that uh, provides for the military. It does not require military expertise. It requires economic and industrial expertise, which Belousov has in spades. So uh, I think that this is a very good appointment, and I think it will produce a very good result. Uh, one of the things that Belousov may be able to do, which he's already done, being intimately involved in, in, in the Russian drone program, is um, spearhead the development of new uh, military technology, various types of lightweight uh, AI, stealthy types of uh, technology that has been making a huge difference on the battlefield recently, um, specifically Anti-drone technology is something that needs to uh, uh, need, needs close attention at this point. Uh, so he he is a, he's a very good pick. When it comes to these new regions that were Ukrainian and right now are officially Russian, has the integration of these regions already started, and are they going to obey the economic law of Russia, or are they going to have some sort of autonomy? Um, well, they, they, they're not really um, discussing autonomy. They're discussing becoming just regular Russian regions. Um, there, there are some specifics as to name. Uh, there may be some specifics as to legislation, although federal reg legislation applies throughout. Uh, the people who live there have received, most of them have already received their Russian passports. Uh, and um, uh, 
the 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 entire uh, area is uh, being updated to Russian standards. The road system, for instance, uh, various other types of interest infrastructure is being updated to the most recent Russian standards. So these are becoming uh, very normal um, Russian regions with the exception of the fact that they have a lot more terrorism going on because of the proximity of a terrorist state called the Ukraine. We've seen that the Russians are doing some movement in Kharkiv. In your opinion, what's the reason behind this and why they're not trying to capture this Edessa and the southern part of Ukraine? Well, the reason that they're not doing those other things is because they haven't been given the orders to do that. The the action in Kharkov has to do with a direct order from from Putin, which was to establish a buffer zone wide enough so that the Ukrainians uh, are unable to uh, launch terrorist strikes on civilian centers within Russian territory. And he specified that the buffer zone has to be sufficiently wide to prevent these attacks, artillery strikes and rocket strikes. And if the depth the depth of the buffer zone turns out to be insufficient, it will need to be increased. So that's what those troops are doing. Is they're establishing a buffer zone. It was the reaction to continuous bombing of Belgorod and the surrounding area, where lots of buildings have been destroyed and entire population centers have had to be evacuated. Uh, lots of people have been killed and are continuing to be killed and, and maimed by these attacks. Um, these attacks are going to dwindle. In fact, they're already dwindling as the Ukrainians are being pushed out of the area. And as Putin said, the, the, the width of the buffer zone will be increased until it is sufficient to stop all such attacks. May 21st, the term of Zelensky is going to end. When it comes to the Russian policy, what they're going to do, what, what's going to be the next step for them, considering Zelensky, if Zelensky doesn't leave his position, what they're going to do, in your opinion? Probably absolutely nothing. Zelensky is basically just a, an American puppet, and he doesn't matter if he gets killed or something happens to him. Americans will just put in another puppet and nothing will change. Uh, he's not by law allowed to uh, enter into negotiations with the Russians. This is a law that he's uh, signed himself, um, which is a funny situation to be in because ultimately the Ukraine will have to unconditionally surrender to Russia. And how is it going to do that if its um, leadership is prevented by law from having anything to uh, to do with with the Russians, um, but you have to understand that uh, okay that uh, Zelensky's presidency is turning into a pumpkin on May twenty first, but the entire governance of the Ukraine has been a pumpkin since uh, two thousand fourteen because the uh, the overthrow of the uh, uh, Yanukovych government was uh, illegitimate and unconstitutional, and every single Ukrainian government ever since then has been illegitimate and unconstitutional. So this is uh, one of those fancy mathematical questions, you know, there's infinity, and then there's uh, another infinity, you know, Aleph naught and, and various other infinities. But but to, a ver to, to an average person who is not into uh, uh, into mathematics, basically, the Ukrainian government is a fraud, and it's going to continue being a fraud. And when it comes to Odessa, we know that how important is this city for Russia and for Ukrainians both. And do you think at the end of the day, Putin would let Odessa to be a negotiating ground for reach some sort of agreement or they're going to catch it they're going to get they're going to take Odessa as well well I, I mean to start with you have to uh you have to understand that there is no grounds for any sort of negotiation because there's no one to negotiate with so all of these people who keep talking about 
uh, negotiating. What they're trying to say is unconditional surrender, but they can't bring themselves to do it. Now, Russia has tried to negotiate on various occasions with bad results. And now the, the people that it might negotiate with, be it Western leaders or American leaders or Ukrainian leaders, uh, there is no point in talking to any of them because they cannot be trusted to keep their word. So what is the purpose of reaching an agreement with people you do not trust because they have broken their word? So what Russia is doing is pursuing its, its aims of uh, demilitarization and denazification of the entire Ukrainian territory. And there's significant mission creep because it turns out that uh, part of the mission is to uh, demilitarize and denazify all of NATO. Uh, which may take some time, but that's going pretty well because NATO is uh, is almost out of um, out of shells that it can and, and other types of armaments that it can share with the Ukrainians. And it also turns out that the armaments that it has shared are of rather low quality. And as the Russians are becoming a very adept at destroying and taking it out, um, so there's nothing really to worry about for the Russians. They're not going to attack NATO countries. They're just going to basically get get the NATO countries to a state where they're no, no longer a military threat to Russia and leave it at that. As far as the Ukraine, I think what it, what, what it will amount to eventually, Russia is in no hurry at all, is unconditional capitulation, unconditional surrender. How do you see the China's policy right now in Europe? Well, China knows very well that if Russia loses, then China is next. So China is very interested in not having Russia lose, no matter what. And China will stand behind Russia and give Russia any support that Russia needs to make sure that it doesn't lose. That that is something that that has to be very well understood. Is that you know basically the Chinese know that they're next, that they would be next, and they're very interested on the other hand, in uh, not uh, cutting this conflict short, because uh, as long as, as NATO is tied down in the Ukraine in this fruitless effort to prop up the, the Zelensky regime, it is not going to open up another front against China because it's too busy. So uh, it is all a very careful bit of timing. Basically, the financial collapse of the United States, which has been scheduled for later this year or perhaps the next, uh, has to happen while the, the Ukraine is still smoldering and uh, swallow, swallowing up uh, huge amounts of resources, most of which are being stolen, because that's the that's the business of the Ukraine is just to steal. Um, so basically, they're supporting Russia to the extent that it takes to keep the keep the conflict going in a way that is beneficial for Russia, because that is beneficial for China. As opposed to everyone else, the little critters, okay, uh, the way to think about it is that there's a, there's a battle going on between um, an elephant and uh, an, a hippopotamus. And the little critters are basically cowering in, in, in their little holes in the ground and peeking out and waiting to see who is going to win. But they're not going to uh, weigh in on one or the other side of this conflict until they see a clear winner. Now, right now, it looks like Russia is the clear winner. At least it is economically. The West is, is cratering economically and Russia is uh, is booming. And, and uh, uh, the Russian economy is growing nicely. Um, the in, Russia's industrial economy is growing by leaps and bounds, and and all of those are very positive developments for Russia. As far as uh, the the battlefront, it has con conclusively Russia that is has conclusively shown that NATO is a paper tiger, that its weapons are no good. They've been uh, put on display in um, in Moscow, and and thousands of people have. Uh, gone to see these blown up tanks and howitzers and and what have you all of these western armaments that the russians have become very good at destroying so basically um 
Russia has uh, has upped its game to a point where it's killing between 1,000 and 1,400 Ukrainian troops a day. Meanwhile, Russian casualties are at an all-time low. Russia has all of the personnel it needs. The Ukraine is woefully short and is basically dismantling existing brigades all along the front, uh, pulling out uh, a few people here, a few people there. Um, and its ability to hold the entire front um, is, is dwindling uh, day by day. Uh, so Russia is going to make progress, but it's it's in no hurry because the game that it's playing is killing 1,400 Ukrainians a day while, while suffering minimal casualties itself. Uh, that can go on until there are more, no, no more Ukrainians willing to fight. That is that is the important turning point for Russia, is when you, the Ukrainian military altogether ceases to exist. Then it will be time to basically lay down the law and, and call for unconditional surrender and, and uh, then basically direct the process of dismantling the Ukrainian state. So that, that's basically what's going on. Uh, but I don't see all of these other countries uh, somehow stepping up and, and giving Russia unconditional support, be they part of BRICS, be they China, be they North Korea or anyone, anyone else. They might pay lip service to the process. They might even provide some, uh, some weapons like uh, the, uh, the, the, the Iranians provided some drones. Um, and, and I'm not sure what the Chinese have provided in terms of armaments, probably nothing. Uh, but uh, that that is basically the, the 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 game is is to see who wins, and it's going to be Russia. Do you think that they're gonna learn from this war in Ukraine and maybe not going after Taiwan or even Iran? Well, I think that NATO is is nothing uh, uh, without the United States, and I I, I think that uh, the the whole reason that. Uh, Vladimir Putin has decided to uh, to take on all of NATO essentially in the Ukraine was because he realized that the the days of the United States are counted as I had before then and have written about extensively. Basically, the the American Empire is at an end. It is it is decrepit. It is. It is falling apart internally. You can see all of these, uh, all of these signs that it is just completely incapable of solving any of its problems internally, and and you can see how its government is just completely lost in 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 a world of make believe that that makes uh, dealing with reality even harder. So basically, this is all very carefully timed. The entire Ukraine operation is very carefully timed so that its end coincides with the end of Pax Americana, the end of the American empire. Without the American empire, lots of things, including South Korea, including Japan, including all of NATO and including Israel will pretty much undergo spontaneous existence fail. It may take them a couple of years, but eventually, they, they will basically cease to be military powers of, of any sort. And, and so that's the thing to look forward to. Do you find any of these countries in Europe, like Slovakia, Serbia, and Hungary, joining BRICS? Is that possible in your opinion? Oh, yes. No, anybody who wants to keep their economy running after the US dollar and the euro go away would want to join BRICS. BRICS has a, a, an interesting plan called the unit, um, uh, which is not really a currency. It's an, an exchange scheme. It's a trading scheme uh, that will allow BRICS members to trade with each other without using either of their national currencies or uh, international reserve currencies. Uh, and without being forced to print an excess of money and issue an excess of money, just in order to uh, cover international trade. Um, it's, it's a brilliant plan, I think. It's been in the, in the works for quite a while. 
Uh, I've written about it and posted recently to my blog because there's been some progress in that area. And uh, I think that any country that really wants to keep uh, its economy running uh, past the point in time when um, the 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 dollar basically turns into dirt, together with uh, the the euro, which is basically a kind of mini me attached to the dollar, uh, would 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 want to pay attention to that. I just want to mention that the link to your blog is going to be in the description of this video. Are they really understanding that this didn't work so far for them and they have to find a solution, a permanent solution in Ukraine? Um, as I said, there isn't going to be any negotiation because there's nobody for Russia to negotiate with. Now, what's going on in the West and all of these, uh, all, of the, all of this vitriol being directed at Putin, Putin is basically being uh, used as a stand-in for Russia. What these people hate is not Putin. What they hate is Russia. And what they hate about Russia is the fact that it exists. It's a most inconvenient place. Every other place, be it China or India or Latin America or Africa, all of these uh, uh, Western empires have been able to conquer and exploit and sometimes uh, practice genocide on their populations. Um, and and uh, make use of in any way they want and basically dominate, except Russia. So Russia is, is the world's largest country by territory. It has two thirds of the uh, various raw materials that the, the entire world needs. And uh, it's not playing ball. It, it's unconquerable. It cannot be won in, in, in any sort of a military conflict. Uh, and, um, the the 1990s experiment with, of of um, basically integrating it into uh, into Europe has been a resounding failure because uh, the Russians were quick enough to to realize that they're basically being cheated, and now they basically understand that uh, the Europeans are the enemy. So what choice do they have except to vent and, and go into hysterics over Putin and calling him Hitler is, is almost a syndrome at this point. And it doesn't really mean anything except that, you know, they're desperate and, and uh, they're running out of things to say. In Africa, we have changes, new changes, Niger and Chad. This can be a new battleground economically and militarily. <laughs> between Russia and China on one side and the United States on the other side? Uh, I think that they're still in denial about it. Uh, there are some differences. The United States uh, is still trying to, to, to see its way through, um, staying in Africa uh, to one extent or another. Um, the French are just in complete denial. They're like a stroke patient that uh, insists that, it, that that his left hand doesn't exist. Um, there is no French Africa. Uh, it, it has ceased to exist. And so they've stopped talking about it. And that's their solution is to stop talking about it. Now they're talking about sending troops to Ukraine on Mondays and Wednesdays and not sending troops to Ukraine on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Something like that. That, that. That's their solution. But basically, they're all pulling out because the Africans understand, first of all, they, they, they remember who liberated them from colonialism. It was the Soviet Union, the Russians. Secondly, now the Russians are arriving in, rel in relatively small numbers, but uh, doing jobs that need to be done as opposed to basically uh, you know, staying inside the military bases flying drones for no apparent reason and eating lunch. Um, so the Russians are there to do a job. And, and lastly, the Russians are not there to teach the local people how to live. They're, they're there to teach the local people how to uh, basically, how to get their sovereignty back and how to fight, how to defend themselves. And that's very pleasing to a lot of uh, lo uh, African leaders. It, I think a lot of Latin American leaders will find that pleasing as well. So this is a very simple approach and a very workable approach from, from the point of view of, of both them and Russia. I, I expect a lot more of that.
you've mentioned that Macron said that they're going to send troops to Ukraine. We know that the reaction coming from Russia was that they are preparing non-strategic nuclear weapons and maybe getting involved as well. And when it comes to non-strategic nuclear weapons on the side, when Russia talking about these things, do you think what would be that red line for Russia? They won't. Uh, the, 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 the thing about Russia's red lines is that you don't know where they are until you've crossed one. And once you've crossed one, it's too late. And, and that's, the, that's the basic game. Uh, if, if you want to play games with Russia, that's what you'll end up with. Now, as far as the strategic, uh, uh, the, 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 the tactical nuclear weapons is what they're called. As far as that goes, Russia has just a huge number of every kind of a tactical nuclear weapon. And uh, it's using them as a deterrent. It's basically, uh, they, they're all kept ready at the entire time. It's not like the, Russia is scrambling to get ready to use them or anything like that. They're, they're ready to be used. Uh, the, the drills that were uh, announced were basically training exercises to make sure that everybody's up to date to the chain of command and how these weapons are used and, and, and basically doing, doing an equipment check. Um, but basically, the, these weapons are going to be used as a deterrent so that people don't try to figure out where Russia's red lines are, because once they figure it out, it'll be too late. They'll be blown up. Um, so that's basically what Russia has, has done. And uh, yes, it's caused a bit of a shock. Um, I think that there's going to be some, some interesting uh, confrontations happening. Um, maybe some planes getting blown out of the sky, uh, maybe some uh, weapons factories in the West. You notice they've been catching on fire lately, uh, one in Germany, one in, um, one in England, and one in Pennsylvania in the United States. So that seems to be a pattern. And so it may be that uh, to completely negate uh, NATO's ability to, to fight any sort of a hot war, um, uh, it don't, it won't take any um, tactical nuclear weapons. It's just a few, a few incendiaries here and there, even if that. This new policy on the part of Putin and Putin and economies at the head of Ministry of Defense, does it have anything to do with what's going on in Ukraine in terms of how long the, this war can take for Russia to put an end to it? Well... Uh, I, I don't think it'll it'll matter directly. I think uh, basically Belarusov uh, will be working pretty hard to optimize and streamline the operation, the uh, the defense establishment, Russia's defense establishment, because what he'll be doing is is looking for redundant spending, looking for functions that are carried out in more than one place for no particular reason. Uh, looking for um, uh, weapon systems that are perhaps in highest demand and, and uh, their manufacturing can be shifted to something that is in higher demand. Uh, looking for ways to integrate various types of innovations, such as AI modules that can uh, figure out what is a tank and, and destroy it autonomously. Um, all of that, all of those sorts of things, and and that's going to take time. Now, Russia is achieving superiority on the battlefield, uh, rather quickly, not not instantaneously, but at a good clip. And to continue doing so involves continuing the conflict. Now, Russia is is setting up this buffer zone so that uh, um, uh, so that Russia itself doesn't get uh, uh, attacked by Ukrainian terrorists so that uh, Russian civilians are, are, are not being killed. Schools and hospitals and, and high-rise buildings aren't being bombed using rockets provided by the West. So that is a very important job and it's being carried out as quickly as possible. As far as the rest of the mission, th there is no hurry. As I said, on average, between 1,000 and 4, uh, 1,400 Ukrainian troops are being killed a day. 
whereas the casualties on the Russian side are minimal and being continuously minimized. So that is a good pattern to be in, and Russia wants to continue in that pattern for as long as possible, because there's there, it has everything to gain and nothing to lose by continuing the conflict. How do you see the conflict right now in Israel, considering these new policies coming from Turkey, coming from Arab states? Well, I, I think that um, the the Israeli economy is going to continue doing continuously worse over time. That is to be expected. It's it's uh, it's fighting a war, and it's not winning. Furthermore, it's. Uh, its um, master and, and provider from across the ocean is balking at providing weapons because of internal political problems. There are pro- protests all over the place um, because I think that there, there, there are two points to it. One is that the case for Israeli or against Israeli genocide of the Palestinians is very cut and dried, very easy to make. Uh, never has there been so obvious a case of genocide. Um, and and secondly, I think that there is some kind of deep state, deep state internal subterfuge going on because I think that part of the deep state uh, has realized that Israel has become useless. It has become a burden, and you can you can see that it has become useless and a burden. From the fact that uh, the the Yemenis, the the uh, uh, the, uh, the the Ansar, uh, uh, I forget Houthis. the exact name, Houthis. Yeah, the Houthis. Yes, they they can pretty much shut down the Suez Canal. And and uh, what is the point of having this unsinkable aircraft carrier called Israel if it doesn't do its job of of keeping keeping the the neighborhood safe? for uh, American shipping, none at all. So uh, basically this is this is just return on investment, how much money is being given to Israel and what is the return on that investment? The, the return on that investment is nothing. And, and so uh, the, other, the other thing is that Israel cannot defend itself and the United States doesn't really want the job of defending Israel anymore as the recent uh, uh, Iranian attack on on Israel has shown. Iran has the ability to shut down and completely deplete uh, Israeli uh, air defense systems. And if it does want to penetrate the uh, Israeli airspace and specifically destroy a target, it has the ability to do that using its hypersonic rocket technology with the, which the United States nor Israel has. So uh, Israel is not defendable from the point of view of the Americans, and it provides no benefit to the Americans in terms of securing trade in the region to America's benefit. So it's, it's become dispensable. And uh, what that means is that Israel in due course will cease to exist. That is part of the reason why the protests, the Free Palestine protests in the United States, which are um, being structured just like the BLM uh, protests, um, uh, just like the the various color revolution protests around the world, based on that same technology and quite lavishly financed. Uh, The organizers are getting thousands of dollars a day but who is who is doing the organizing? Well, they, these are people who have, uh, uh, I think, America's interests in mind. They they want to free the United States from from this burden of uh, of supporting uh, uh, this this useless entity called Israel. That is, I think, really what's going on. Mm-hmm.